Hi, and welcome to Take Every Thought Captive, our weekly look at the Catholic intellectual tradition and an exploration of the author's books and topics that have shaped Catholic thinking for 2,000 years. My name is Jason Gale, and I'm joined this week by Dr. Benjamin Smith, our lecturer in philosophy at Catholic Studies Academy. And today our topic is uh, modernism and anthropocentrism in catechetics. <laughs> So this we were, flows off the tongue. Yeah, that's right. We were trying to find a longer uh, longer title, and we just couldn't, so we'll have to stick with this one. Maybe we should put it in German. <laughs> yeah, that would make it sound really good. <laughs> uh, all right, so our topic, like I said, we're gonna what we want to do today is look at some of the errors of, of modernism, some of the underlying philosophies of modernism, and kind of how it affected theology, and one of the, the most important principles in... Um, asking the question, what happened to catechesis in the 20th century, which is a question that a lot of people ask, and I get asked a lot, uh, uh, is to to begin with that basic premise that what happens in philosophy affects theology, what happens in theology sure. affects liturgy, affects catechetics, uh, and affects so many other things uh, with regards to that. Mm-hmm. Uh, uh, and so modernism is a great place to begin when you're talking about anything sure. in the 20th century, uh, because of how um, kind of widespread it was, but also because of, of its very nature that, you know, that it, um, Pius X, you know, called it uh, a synthesis of all heresies. So it wasn't just a particular yeah. heresy that it was uh, kind of this uh, perfect storm of heresies. And so um, uh, let's begin there, Dr. Smith. Uh, maybe we can begin with maybe looking at some of what are some of the, the influential philosophies that, uh, that either supported or, or led to uh, some of the theological errors later on in, in modernism? Sure, Jason. Uh, the, the most important, uh, of course, would be, as I often say, Kant. <laughs> uh, Immanuel Kant, a uh, German philosopher, sometimes called the sage of Konigsberg. Um, but before I, I, I talk about him, I just want to point out something you just said. That I think it's really important. Um, you know, philosophy always affects theology and then theology flows downhill into uh the various ministries uh the various um um you know aspects of church life this is why it's so important to know at least a little philosophy right because if you don't know any then you've got one you just don't realize it (laughs) (laughs) yeah you're gonna have philosophy and if you're not at least thinking a little bit philosophically then you're gonna end up uh, adopting a philosophy and interpreting your theology in view of that philosophy without ever realizing it, right? right? Which is, I think, one of the things that's important about what we're doing with Catholic Studies Academy, right? Is that we're showing the connection between philosophy uh, and theology. Yeah. Um, but to your uh, your direct question there, I think the most important person in the development, oddly enough, I would say the most important person in the development of modern theology. So we'll say theology in the 19th century and the 20th century mm-hmm. would be Immanuel Kant. Now, Immanuel Kant is not a 19th century figure, but his moves kind of set up what happened in 19th century German philosophy, mm-hmm. which if you know anything about the development of theology, really kind of what's called liberal Protestant theology in Germany, right? So right. it's a specific uh, historical period when you use it in that way, right? Mm-hmm. Um, it flows from Immanuel Kant. Um, <clears throat> if anybody's heard uh, any of our earlier uh, podcasts where we talked about Immanuel Kant, they'll know some, they should know some basic ideas. The, the, the kind of foundational idea for Kant, right, is this division between the phenomena and the noumena. Mm-hmm. And that is the idea that the human person has preset categories through which data is interpreted. And that means that our experience is both intelligible, we can understand it, because it's sort of our mind makes it to where it can be understood, right? Mm -hmm. But it also means that we never understand the thing in itself, reality in itself. This is why Kantianism is called uh, critical idealism. That is, what we understand is not the mind reflecting reality, but rather the mind shaping reality into a subjective experience. Does that make sense? Yeah, it does. And and one of the very first kind of tools I used uh, for our listeners uh, um, 
when you when you hear this idea, uh, uh, the the connection I had always made, uh, uh, kind of the, the the basis of my understanding of Kant was, uh, you can't know anything, um, <laughs> you know, <laughs> and that was that's how I began to to okay, when I hear when I hear when I hear people bring up you know uh, Kantian philosophy. That idea that, that that you really can't know anything that it's that the best you can do is understand how uh, your mind is shaping reality as That's opposed right. of your That's mind right. actually grasping reality. Uh, so right. you can't really know anything. You just kind of know things uh, by their appear appearances and your interpretation of those appearances. That's um, right. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I think Kant would want to say, well, you can know your own experience, right? Um, but that's it, yeah. you know, like you don't know the thing in itself. And that's the key point. Um, now I'm, we're, I'm being very broad here with Kant. Sure. Uh, he's not a, a, a radically subjective individualist. He thinks inconsistently, he thinks all human beings have the same set of preset categories. And so he thinks we all have a similar experience later. Modern philosophers are going to push on that. Right. 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 And end up pushing towards, you know, it's just very, it's historically situated. And that's where you get really um, 19th century German mm -hmm. uh, liberal Protestantism, right? Which, of course, many Protestants also rejected, um, but uh, was a, a theological movement that was very powerful, uh, certainly among the Protestant churches and communities, but then also kind of bled over into um, uh, the Catholic uh, uh, church, one other thing, uh, aspect of Kant that's important because it links with uh, Schleiermacher, easy to say, <laughs> right? <laughs> the, um, but anyways, uh, uh, what, a, what a name, right? That's but anyways, um, <clears throat> another aspect of Kant that was important was this division between um, the practical and the theoretical. Mm -hmm. So what we might call the practical and the descriptive or the explanatory. So on the one hand, Kant thought, well, we have our minds that, that think about the way things are, that try to describe experience. But then there's another part of our mind, which is, uh, has to do with um, making, our, making decisions, planning the future, judging whether something should or should not be done, that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. Now, that's a, a fairly common distinction, except that he really separates the two. He says the two have nothing to do with each other. Mm. So on the one hand, you've got the theoretical and the descriptive. But what you describe in being has nothing to do with um, the kinds of practical judgments you make. Um, and so that's a real hard division, right, yeah. between the two. And Schleiermacher, who's a later 19th century, uh, well, mid-19th mid century uh, thinker, it's kind of a romantic in a way, um, he uh, he comes. He, he uh, Kant just dominates the German mind. Everything after Kant really is just after Kant. So <laughs> Schleiermacher doesn't agree with Kant altogether, but he kind of starts with his philosophical presuppositions, and so he starts with this idea of this division between uh, experience on the one hand, the theoretical and the pro uh, and the practical, right? Mm -hmm. um, so. Anyways, uh, he says, well, what's the bridge in between? And he says, well, uh, it's religious experience. It's religious experience that bridges the two, right? Uh, it's almost kind of like a leap between, right, um, the two. Uh, and so religious experience becomes the thing where the practical and the theoretical meet. But it is very importantly indescribable. Um, <laughs> So uh, when you have a religious experience... That's quite experience, convenient. That seems almost really like is, convenient right? to yeah. your own this tendencies. A, <laughs> yeah, this is... Um, it's something that's interior. Yeah. It's a feeling of... This is really interesting because it's a there's, there's a kernel of truth to it. It's a feeling of dependence upon God. Mm -hmm. And then he abstracts even a feeling of dependence upon the whole. Uh, that is, that I'm a part of a macro whole or universe upon which I'm radically dependent. And that feeling, when we have it, those moments, right, we have that feeling, that's the the core of religion, mm -hmm. where the, the the gap between the phenomenal and the noumenal, the practical and the theoretical are overcome in a moment of, of this sort of interior feeling of dependence. But that feeling, that is the truth of religion. Everything uh, yeah. after that, right, is... Um, 
at best, I think you would say the uh, the furniture in the chapel, right? <laughs> it's it, like so dogmas. I mean, he's he's very clear. Yeah, Theologians yeah. kill kill religion, right? Um, uh, because the words um, block and distort um, the original experience. Does that sound almost kind of scarily familiar? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it does. And it, it also, you know, to, to me, it also points to almost a utilitarian view of religion that it's only good in so far as it makes you do your moral duty. You know, it may, it's, it's well, that's it, certainly, that would certainly have been Kant's view. Actually, that's not Schleiermacher's view. Schleiermacher thought because Kant turned religion simply into morality. He said yeah. religion in, is morality, particularly Kantian ethics. So Christianity <laughs> is good because it's similar to Kantian ethics, basically. <laughs> um, but uh, Schleiermacher wanted to say no. Even morality is second to mm. this internal experience that you have. Um, so it's just an important qualification. But that's certainly <laughs> in the mix. Now, how does this now how does this flow into theology? How did this maybe uh, uh, affect some of that uh, early twentieth century uh, uh, theology? Well, really, it had its biggest impact in, in late nineteenth century theology. Um, but the um, the in, among the German Protestant theologians, and this would have kind of flowed over into uh, what is Alfred Luisi? Is that how yeah, you say his name? We see yeah. George Cheryl, Yeah. Yeah, the the Catholic modernist. Um, but the idea really is that, you know, in what we get in sacred scripture mm -hmm. is a kind of original experience of Jesus the or the religious experience of the Israelites, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. And um, everything that flows after that, even really kind of in scripture, right? is a mere recording of a unrepeatable uh, experience of that the Israelites or the apostles or that community. So you might say, look, this is an important witness, that, like that kind of language. Yeah. This is an important sign. Um, uh, it's an important memory, right, yeah. of, of what happened, right? Um but it's not a revelation of God in himself. Like that. So what we're getting in sacred scripture is not Jesus in himself, not God in himself. Um, uh, same be with certainly with sacred tradition. Um, what we're getting really is a, a particular, a historically situated exper religious experience that's expressed in certain dogmas, expressed in certain practices, but doesn't get to the thing in itself. Um, and so... What ha what's happening there is you think as you think about it, then you say, oh well, okay, experience changes, historical circumstances change, communities um, change, yeah, communities change, right? Uh, and so, what you end up doing is you end up sort of instead of God <clears throat> being the standard for theology, human experience and the experience of the community becomes the standard for theology. And so theology becomes simply an expression, not of God's self-revelation, right? Mm -hmm. But rather, theology becomes an expression of the community as it's historically situated. And for our listeners, remember that thought. We're going to come back to that thought because it comes up again uh, in the 1980s uh, mm -hmm. in, in, a very, in a very scary way. Um, but that idea of that, uh, that scripture is... It, Yes, it's inspired, and we can go through that. But it's but it's primarily that religious experience of the community of G, you know, uh, with with God. Uh, uh, that becomes a very central uh, focus for a lot of theologians and practitioners, catechists uh, uh, later on um, uh, in the nineteen seventies and eighties. And so modernism was, you know, condemned several times, <laughs> which I always think, which I always think is is interesting because when you look at the the, the actions of the church, particularly in the twentieth century, you know, um, Vatican II set aside, you know, or well, actually the whole history of the church, much of it is always done in response to something, uh, mm -hmm. much, you know, the whether you're talking about early councils or statements or right. encyclicals, you know, a lot of it's always done in response to something. Uh, right. And so it's good to note that uh, modernism was condemned several times. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> right. Yeah. Um, can you? Uh, so sure. I, mean, I think that encyclical was Pashindi, right? Yeah, that was a, yeah, that was uh, one of the first uh, ones. Yeah. 
And then Laban Tabale, is that the, 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 the syllabus of errors that goes with that one? Yeah, or Laban La Tabale was, was first in 1907. Okay. Uh, Pashindi okay. was in 1910. And then 1910 was okay. also when uh, Pius X issued the oath against modernism. Okay. So it's so it's so, one of those things. Not only did he condemn it, but he's like, <laughs> you need to take an explicit oath against it. Yeah, Jason, you know, I've got an idea for reform. <laughs> uh, how do we fix it? Maybe, maybe one thing we could do is just bring back the oath. I right, think... We could just start like a, a movement, bring back the oath, right? You know, like... Build the oath. That's right. That's right. <laughs> That's right. Like, I want everybody to sign the oath. And if you don't sign the oath, you're out. That's it. Like you got is it two options, sign the oath or go. <laughs> what do you think? I like yeah, it's a good, I mean, it's a, it's a good place to begin. I mean, it's a good. Uh... <laughs> and, and so, I mean, like, I, I think for our listeners, if you want to get a, a good, uh, a good idea of more of some of the. Because uh, when Pius X uh, condemned it, he condemned it in sixty-seven propositions. So it wasn't like he was, and, and and which which I think is interesting because modernism a, it's uh, like he said a synthesis of all heresies. So it's very difficult to like nail down into a proper definition, uh, but it has a, a whole lot of things uh, uh, sure. that that it brings into in different ways and different flavors yeah. of modernism uh, um, uh, can highlight or, or emphasize uh, different aspects. Yeah, if I remember correctly, that, that part of the reason for that is that he sees modernism affecting different areas of thought, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. So he's, he's sort of the modernist as apologist, the modernist as scripture scholar, the modernist as whatever, right? Um, which I think is really interesting because I would actually argue that a lot of so-called conservative Catholic apologetics ends mm -hmm. up being kind of modernist if you really start to dig into it, but maybe that's not a podcast. <laughs> um, the, um, uh, can you kind of give us Jason, like just one, I mean, I know you said, just said 67 propositions. So I'm going to ask for the impossible, but like, what's your, I, I have one in my own mind, like what I've tried to kind of, when I, cause I've actually worked with Pichendi a, a large amount and, one of the projects I've always wanted to do is a philosophy class on Pashendi, right? Uh, where you looked at it specifically as a work of philosophy, mm -hmm. um, just to kind of trace out the philosophical roots. So I've spent some time trying to think about the best way to summarize it. What's your What's your shot at trying to summarize the the, the kernel there of modernism? Yeah, I would say it's th it's the um, it's either, and again, because it's hard to to nail down. It's either the the denial of any super anything that's supernatural, so mm -hmm. the complete denial that that uh, uh, that anything is supernatural, or it's the yeah. reduction of all supernatural to the natural. So mm -hmm. they would say something like, you know, um, uh, everything is God's grace, you know. And so I mean, even mm -hmm. a, even a, even a Thomist would say, eh, maybe, you know. Uh, no, no, I don't know. No, no. 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 <laughs> okay. <laughs> No. Okay. Thomas so, I mean, not to uh, well, people, but, this is so important. Yeah. Because one of the things that people bash Thomas on all the time is nature grace dualism. You guys distinguish nature and oh, grace. Oh yeah, so, yeah, yeah, that, yeah. Yeah. And it's a huge issue. It's a huge issue. Uh even uh reputable Catholic theologians uh bash Thomas on this. But you know, Thomas is a doctor for a reason, guys. Yeah. Right. Um like <laughs> he knows what he's about. Um uh, Certainly, everything comes from God, but when we're talking about the term grace, grace. Right, yes, yeah, right? yeah, it's a specific. It's a spe the church distinguishes those things. And this is the this distinction is made very clearly in the Catechism of the Council of Trent and in the uh, decrees of the Council of Trent. Um, it's important to distinguish those things. They're not opposed, okay? right, right, yeah, but uh, but they are distinct. And when you're talking about grace, you're talking about a power, a reality, a kind of almost energy. That's distinct from nature. Nature being an intrinsic principle of motion and development. Yeah. Uh, you know, grace being a supernatural something, some energy or quality that's added to that intrinsic principle of uh, development. Yeah, supernature. Yeah. So I would say, yeah, modernism is either is either the denial of any su anything supernatural, or mm -hmm. it's the reduction of of all uh, supernatural events, all of God's grace. Uh, to the natural so that everything becomes sure. kind of on this equal footing. And, and essentially it's a complete just horizontal view of the world of people in it uh, um, because, and, 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 you know, even the, 
the oath uh, oath against modernism brings up the idea of pantheism you know where where right. it's it, it it kind of uh, falls into that where uh everything is grace therefore you know essentially nothing is grace yeah you know yeah. that's good i like that it's a good way of um uh um well, you could say everything is grace, therefore everything is justified, everything is saved, every, you know, right? And that's what everybody's that's what re- they, yeah, everybody's that, religious experience is valid. That's and right. correct. And that's exactly where twentieth yeah. century thought has gone, including von Balthasar. Um, <clears throat> but the um, uh, um, what I yeah, I think that's good, Jason. Uh, I would just add mm-hmm. to that. Uh, when I think about it, I tend to put the emphasis on religion as idealism. Um, mm-hmm. So that you're one of the things that keeps coming up in, in his discussion is the religious sense. Uh, right. Say, the Tenth talk, talks about this a good bit. People don't use that term exactly any very much anymore, but something like it, right? And this, this, it's a key point here: natural inclination, right? Yeah. That we all have towards God, towards the true God. This is why I'm always a little like, you got to be careful, right? More careful than we usually are about the idea that we're all seeking God, right? Because the modernists take that and then what they do is they say, well, look, we're all looking for God. That's false, (laughs) according to sacred scripture, right? Um, We're all naturally looking for God. See, that's the key move there, right? Yeah. And then within our own circumstances, that gets worked out differently, right? And so one ear, one, one, one hallmark of modernism, Mm -hmm. if not the essence, I think, is this kind of idealism where you end up saying, my personal subjective experience, Mm -hmm. right, becomes the standard of theology, right? So very much like Schleiermacher's view that theology is simply the expression of the historically situated experience of the believing community or the individual believer. Yeah. So one of the, um, or or look at a couple of the, the, the propositions that were explicitly condemned, uh, uh, by Pius X. And and these are, you know, two that I think are, are, well, there's 67 that are very important, but we're just going to pick out two here. Um, but, but he explicitly condemns the idea that revelation could be nothing else than the consciousness of man acquired by his revelation to God. That's explicitly <laughs> condemned. The next one being revelation constituting the object of the Catholic faith was not complete with the apostles. Uh, Ooh, yeah. So, I mean, the, the revelation, <laughs> revelation was a huge, uh, uh, uh whether it's a, that's an enormously important proposition. It is. It is. And it's, and, and, and this is, and we'll, let's get into, to why, especially those I think uh, are important for when we move into the area of catechesis and looking at, you know, what happened to catechesis in the 20th century. So that I, that idea that uh, uh, revelation or that religious experience takes that, that almost Mm -hmm. highest point, um, um, Experience then becomes uh, uh, this this place of encounter, if you will. If we use some some old but modern language here, <laughs> um, it becomes it becomes that place uh, where we seek God. So in 1966, there was a uh, a student. It was a, he was a Christian brother at uh, the Catholic University of America, and uh, yeah. I, so I guess it was the. Uh, uh, yeah, the, I love it, alma mater. <laughs> <laughs> but totally different in the '60s, right? Yeah, might as well have been a different school. So that's right. <laughs> so uh, this this Christian brother named Gabriel Moran, um, who would later go on to leave the priesthood and marry an ex nun, um, nice. and uh, he wrote his dissertation on the theology of revelation. Now. Uh, Gabriel Moran, he was primarily a uh, kind of a theologian in this way, um, but uh, he soon went into the area of catechesis uh, to, to the to the point where uh, one um, uh, one commentator or one kind of catechetical expert in the 1990s, his name was Michael Warren. He put out a couple of uh, uh, collections of essays called the Source Book for Modern Catechetics or Catechesis or something. Um, uh, but uh, he called he called Gabriel Moran um, uh, one of the most influential persons on the catechetical scene during this time. So here you're talking about 
uh, somebody who had tremendous uh, influence on catechesis, and I would say for at least the next 30 to 40 years, uh, um, writing his dissertation on the theology of Revelation. And, and in one of the introductions I remember reading, the, 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 I think it was a priest, was, was just praising him on how brave he was for taking up this, uh, uh, this idea of Revelation. So, what does he say about Revelation? He's, he, yeah. he states, Revelation is, quote, a universal phenomenon present mm-hmm. in the life of every individual and all religions. Right, right, yeah. So he goes on and he'll say, Revelation is not the deposit of faith, as the church teaches. Yeah. Now, that let's go. Like, that's a, that sounds like heresy. I mean, yeah, now let's, right. <laughs> let's take a quick trip back to what was just condemned. You know, the, so you have... So, so in, during this time, you have uh, um, this. A, you have the the occasion of Vatican II. I'm not going to blame the problems of catechetics on Vatican II or say that it was the cause, but people did take it as the occasion to experiment with a lot of things. And we know that. Sure. I mean, the most obvious examples are the liturgy, um, but that wasn't the only place. Um, and so you had uh, uh, people taking up th- these ideas and putting them into practice. Now, I will say, and I've said this before, like, I'm cool with speculative theology. Like, I, I'm, I'm okay with that. Like, I understand uh, people wanting to work things out and, and think about things in a kind of a public view. But what I am against is speculative catechesis. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> because that has uh, a very real, real effects. Uh, on 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 a lot of people, and so uh, Gabriel Moran was a huge figure with his idea of revelation, and particularly uh, his idea that revelation primarily happens between the person and God. Yeah. This is the place for revelation, um, and uh, and he literally states, he says, "quote There is no revelation except in God revealing Himself to personal experience." Yeah, that's, you know, that's a, it's so important. And go ahead. Well, I was going to say, and, and you know, for for some of us, it may it, you you may say, well, that doesn't sound so bad because I've had those aha moments where sure. I feel that 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 God's grace has has uh, you know enlightened my mind uh, to some you know has you know we can call that maybe a kind of revelation, or we we may even uh, call it that. You know, I, it was revealed to me. You know, now. That's a big difference between saying, like, I understood something, then there is no uh, revelation outside of my experience with God. Like, that's, yeah. that's huge. Yeah, it is. Um, two things here. One is, while you're quite right regarding speculative theo- the difference between speculative theology and catechesis, um, there are bounds within speculative theology as well. Right. We push those bounds maybe. Um, but you know, that's just, that just is heretical given what you just <laughs> quoted. Right. I mean, like there is a deposit of faith to say that there is not a deposit of faith, an objective body of knowledge. Yeah. Right. Uh, that's been handed on in the church and commented on the church and, you know, further con- consequences and thoughts have been drawn from it. Right. Mm-hmm. Um, people don't like the deposit word. Right. Yeah. Um, uh, but it's there and you can't get rid of it. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> right. Yep. But what's, what's, uh, what's philosophically and theoretically important about this is that there is objective propositional content right mm-hmm. uh i remember one time being in a conversation with a a fella i was a nice guy i was at an academic conference and we had a good good conversation we kept kind of clashing or missing each other in a nice you know kind of friendly <laughs> academic way but after a while i finally got to what what i was sort of you know in the conversation trying to figure out like what was our different what, what was the underlying different assumption uh, and i thought what it really was, and we get this came up came out in the conversation is, I think propositions matter, and he didn't, right? And and then he thought, well, why do propositions matter? Like it's just words, right? It's just <laughs> stupid words. Social contracts, right? 
Yeah, right. Yeah. What sociology professor said that's just, you know, <laughs> whatever. All right. Uh, but why do why do propositions matter? Because propositions signify reality. Yeah. So the, the point being that there is a given reality that has revealed itself, right, to man in a definitive way. And to ignore that body of knowledge is to ignore that reality. Right. Do you see what I'm saying? Yeah. You know, so that's the key, right? Is that my subjective experience can be all over the map. Sometimes it's good, sometimes it's bad, it's whatever. But there's a measure outside of my subjective experience, and mm -hmm. it's called the revelation of God, right? <laughs> and that revelation is contained in sacred scripture and sacred tradition. Um, that's the measure against which I that, – that's the standard against which I measure my subjective experience. If my subjective experience is, you know, um, probably, you know, murder is occasionally okay, then I'm wrong yeah. objectively, Right. You know, it's okay to commit adultery sometimes. Sometimes. No, nope. yeah. no, no, mm -mm. never. Not only once. Right. <laughs> and we know that because there's an objective standard outside of our own subjective experience. So you might be feeling like Susie is just great and you have this deep, wonderful, meaningful connection to Susie, mm -hmm. but it doesn't matter. It's irrelevant. Yeah. Right. Because there's an objective standard outside of you, namely revelation. Yeah. And, and you can even see this in, during this time in the 60s, 70s and 80s, you can even see this in the, in the, uh, the language that, uh, that the church uses. and we can do a whole podcast on this, but it was the, the movement from using even the word catechesis to religious education. Uh, um, because, because the idea, like I said, we could do a whole nother one on this, but the idea, <laughs> but the idea being catechesis is that you're forming somebody in a particular faith, Whereas because revelation happens between God and another person, man has created a religious being, uh, therefore the best that we can do or what catechesis should actually do is kind of just awaken this religious sense within the person and create yeah, the yeah. environment uh, for this, this encounter between uh, uh, God and man or, or God and uh, people. Sorry, I, I apologize for using the word man. Uh, please don't, don't you know hate me online for using the word man but uh but it but it became uh that the, this whole focus uh went in that way and yeah, again yeah, very yeah, it's very anthropocentric yeah yeah and again th yeah this is what this is kind of the highlight of what kind of this this uh anthropocentric turn uh took um almost to the point where you know later on in the 1980s there was a guy named thomas groom uh who developed a methodology called shared christian praxis which uh, began with, uh, um, <laughs> yeah, great words. Uh, I just sorry, that's just this is Marxist terminology, right? Like, yeah, well, and, like that 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 language grows out of uh, Marxism. I mean, just as a historical point, it just does. Sorry, good. Yeah, and and the 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 I guess the 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 nice thing, like if you if for the for our listeners out there, if you want to go read about these things, the nice thing is that these people, uh, many of these these authors and these writers. Uh, the, they're not necessarily ashamed or they try to hide these. Uh, Thomas, right. in, in Thomas Grimm's book, he, he, he thanks Paulo Freire, a Marxist philosopher, right. uh, who wrote a book called Pedagogy of the Oppressed. Uh, <laughs> right. And, and he, great. so yeah, right around the time, like in between thanking Thomas and uh, Kant, and I think Hegel, uh, he thanks uh, Paulo Freire in there. Um, but, uh -huh. but, but he, but he says, you know, in, at the very beginning of his, his methodology, he says, there needs to be a focusing activity, which turns people into their own being in their place and in their time. And this establishes a focus for the curriculum. So the uh -huh. curriculum literally is you. Like, I don't know yeah. how, how more anthropocentric could you get <laughs> than literally saying, not only are we going to focus on me, but I'm right. going to be the curriculum. Yeah. Concretely, how does the, I mean, there's just so much to say here. <laughs> and uh, yes, the, like <laughs> the Catholic church is crumbling, right? In a lot of ways, sadly, yeah. statistically. Um, and you're like, well, of course it is, right? And, yeah. and, and, you know, if that's our catechesis, well, no wonder people would leave, right? Yeah. You know, like 
be. Hmm, I, I'm the subject matter of religion, right? Well, you know what? You're a you know you're a fallen human being, right? yeah. <laughs> you know, and and then if if you think if your thoughts about God are based on yourself, then you're going to have false and erroneous thoughts about God, and false and erroneous thoughts about God that lead you to leave the Catholic Church, right? Uh, you know what I'm saying? It makes sense, right? Yeah. Because you know uh, that you because of the way humans are without grace. Um, we're going to have a tendency away from Catholic truth, right? Away from Christian truth because um, uh, of our fallen nature. And if that's your study, if that's what you're learning, mm -hmm. right? As Christianity, you're, I mean, this is so perverse. Your learning of Christianity is going to lead you to not be Christian. Yeah. That's, right? yeah, and, that's a, f so, and, 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 and you know, again, ever since I've read the screw tape letters, I always think if I were <laughs> if I were the devil, what would I do? I mean, I wouldn't say, you know, God doesn't exist. I would just say, you know, well, God doesn't really love you. You know, how sure. about I create a version of what they think is Christianity but is not? Like right, that's right, right, in, right. in a way that's that's brilliantly evil. Well, um, nobody today. Oh, yeah, but let me. Uh, we, nobody's <laughs> gonna say today God doesn't love you. That's not. Everybody's gonna say God loves you. God is love. God loves you. Yeah. God loves you so much that He loves your adultery. <laughs> right. God loves you so much that yeah. He's not gonna deny you sodomy. Right. Right. We, like it's. It, that's the real move there. Right. Yeah. Is that you're gonna. Um, uh, and, the, gonna and the devil is not a personal that. reality. Yeah. <laughs> yeah exactly. Right. <laughs> You're going to replace the God of the Bible and the God of right reason with some sort of lovable fuzzball um, that just affirms, right? Right. Your experience. That's yes, that's a key, right? It affirms my experience. So look, I got to divorce my wife because I'm really into Susie, right? And, you know, God blesses that, right? I mean, he loves me. God. I just love. So yeah. he, he loves that. Right? He wants me to be happy. He wants me to right. be happy. Yeah, yeah. That's right. It's too bad for my wife, but, you know, Susie and me, <laughs> you know, come on. My subjective experience is the revelation of God's will about that, right? Yeah, well, obviously and, that's problems, but anyways. And that's exactly how the the groom's methodology was. So we we do right. this we do this activity where we where we uh, think about our own experience. Right. We critic critically. He does use that word. Cri we critically reflect on our own experience, and then what's we, the criteria for that criticality? Uh, your feelings. <laughs> <laughs> so then, what we do. <laughs> This is serious. All right. So <laughs> then what we do is we take that, that, that experience that we've critically reflected on and we put it in a conversation. Now we yeah. put it in dialogue with what he calls yeah. the Christian story. And, and he even goes so far as to say my methodology can work for any religion, sure. um, but I'm Christian. So it's going to be in a Christian context. So we're going to put it in, um, in, uh, in dialogue yeah. with, um, um, the, the Christian story in dialogue with my experience. Now, now uh -huh. again, that may sound, you know, like ambiguous at best, but if it's based on uh, a Marxist philosophy, it's not a nice, pleasant conversation. <laughs> I mean, it's, it's one of them is fighting to win. One of them is right, oppressed. Right. One of them is the oppressor. And so you, yeah. you put them in conversation and then you come up, with a solution, a, a resolution to, to change your life and to, and to live better after that. Right. Now, yeah. and, and, and again, you know, that's how, that's how his methodology works out. But, but again, I want to go back to what we had said about modernism, because when he says we bring in the Christian story to talk about our, uh, to put it in dialogue with mm -hmm. our experience, that doesn't sound so bad. It sounds like I'm taking my Catholic faith and I'm using it as the standard to which I'm judging my experience. Yeah. That is not the case. Because no. here's here's what he says about the Christian story. He says, retrieval of the Christian story is guided by any consensus understanding articulated by the community's magisterium. Oh. Uh, yeah. Um, <laughs> That's so bad. <laughs> And of course, he ends it retrieval. Like group a group idealism. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And he says retrieval is informed by the sense of the faithful about what is true, uh, you know. And so, and so again, it goes back to not just the, not 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 even like an individualistic perspective, but but the idea that the community's experience is mm -hmm. is kind of uh, is part of that revelation. 
So, I mean, sure, even when you think sure. about what the what the modernists were saying about sacred scripture, uh, mm-hmm. that, you know, that was the that was the Israelites experience of God. That was mm-hmm. the, the apostles experience of God. Right, um, right, right. And so revelation doesn't end there. It continues right. after that yes, in right. each community as we progress through uh, through history. Um, yeah, yeah, that's good, Jason, to bring that out. And I, th- I hope our listeners see the sort of strong connection here. It takes sometimes ideas a long time to develop yeah. their full fruits, right? But this it should it should be fairly clear that how this goes back to Kant and Schleiermacher, right? This this division between the noumena and the phenomena, the idea that the individual or in this case the community shapes its own experience, right? Yeah. Uh, that that its experience then becomes the standard, right? Uh, for talking about reality. That's a long story, right? I mean it's a long it narrative historically to go from Kant to to you know mid twentieth century catechesis, but the line is there. Yeah, and and kind of the the final thing I want to point to with this kind of um, uh, methodology, uh, and, and just so our listeners know, uh, 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 Thomas Groom is he's still a professor today of religious education. His his uh, methodology is, is still praised and widely used in a lot of places. Um, but you know, you may you may be thinking to yourself, well, you know, what if in that methodology? Uh, my Catholic faith, uh, or the the Catholic faith, comes into contact, or comes into conflict with my experience. So, kind of like you know, what what happens in this in this real way, if that happens? He brings this up, and and he relies on uh, Father Richard McBrien's Catholicism book, which very influential yeah, book. Yeah, very very inf- sadly a very influential book. Mm-hmm. But he but he simply states dissent against a dogmat a non dogmatic teaching a doctrine is always a possibility. And he gives three criteria for when dissent is possible. He says one, the teaching did not seem to make sense. Uh, number two, um, that the t te- or, or I'm sorry one and the other I'm sorry he gives uh, three I'm going to just focus on two and the third one being. The teaching conflicts with one's own Christian experience. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So yeah. if your experience comes into conflict with uh, maybe some standard that the Catholic faith has put out there, uh, uh, and it and it conflicts with your Christian experience, uh, that it's okay. It's okay yeah. to dissent from that teaching. Um, yeah, and, and, and what that implies, even if he doesn't say it outright almost, I mean, besides me speaking false and erroneous and heretical but right. what that implies i mean besides all that right <laughs> what that implies is that what you're rejecting as not conforming to your experience may be rejected because it's just the experience of somebody else right yeah like there's an equalization well so that's an ancient israel israelite or hebrew experience or whatever it might be you know, the 16th century experience of Baroque, blah, 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 whatever. Yeah. You know, fine. So, you know, it's just like we, we reject their views about sanitation and germs. We can also, <laughs> you know, reject their experience of the mass or their experience of whatever. The community has changed. So it's just like this Christianity then is always a moving target, right? Yeah. It's, 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 it's always changing now what the what everybody says now instead of just using the word change we'll say evolving right yeah yeah because every change is an evolution apparently <laughs> uh but uh you know it's evolving from one thing to another and 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 we should actually probably presuppose that our experience may be even better than the uh, than the experience of others but if not better then at least equal right right right, and right. of course this, this this totally um ends up rejecting revelation right as yeah as a reality and so this is why i just i, I always i mean i always uh, you know well both by temperament but also on principle i'm always a curmudgeon in the room when people start talking about like <laughs> their experience too much right in terms of it being the standard of religious practice or belief i, I just have to say i mean experience is important right yeah yeah, yeah. so but it's second yeah. Oh gosh, we're coming back to the same thing we always come back to, Jason. Right? Which is, you can distinguish things and still prioritize them and connect them. Yep, right? Yep. This is right. This is the key point. Right? My experience is important. It's just not the standard. Right? Right. The standard is the word of God. 
is, is divine revelation, which is a deposit that's intelligible and immutable, right? <laughs> yeah, well, <laughs> sort of, if you really want to go that way. <laughs> But but like but like one of the things you you heard you commonly heard in like the eighties and nineties was and this and, and again you, you also have to think about the time you had the explosion of the social sciences, uh, uh, so, uh, psychology was was taking over many uh, or, or influencing many fields of theology and and uh, uh, manipulating it in in a lot of different ways, um, but you also had uh, kind of weird ideas or, or wrong ideas. Uh, in education as well, you know, um, pragmatism was huge, uh, uh, and Thomas Groom praises pragmatism to some degree because it's about a right. result. That's the important yeah. thing, you know. It's still huge education. Yeah, yeah, it's yeah. it's still huge. And so you had, uh, I I remember I I had people tell this to me to my face. We were talking about like RCIA, and I was saying how, you know, the goal is 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 to get to the end of the RCIA process to have people. Look at the articles of faith and say credo, credo, credo. Mm. And they disagreed with me. They said, "What's not the?" In so many words, they said the product is not important. It's the process. As long <laughs> as we've gone through the process, uh, uh, whatever the product may be, mm. is as good mm -hmm. as any other. Mm -hmm. And, and mm -hmm. so you, you you just see this this whole thing about process. It's all about the process. You know so. The Which content goes to experience, yeah, it's, it goes to experience, right? Having right. a certain kind of experience, right, is what catechesis is all about. But the church tells us that that's wrong, right? I mean, the church tells us that catechesis is um, organic and systematic instruction in Christian faith, Christian doctrine, right? Yeah. Um, doctrine, teaching, propositions, Doct knowledge, right? Yeah, yeah. So it literally flips it on its head where method becomes more important than content. Right. Uh, um, and, well, and that's, that's modern education. Yeah. I mean, yeah, exactly. Know. I mean, and, and people, I mean, like when you, you see like, you know, things like common core math, people are like, what the, <laughs> you know, and, yeah. and they'll say things like, well, it's not important that they get the right answer. It's important that they go through the process. Yeah. I've gotten to where I don't even like the language of content. I, it's so ubiquitous that I have to use it, but, um, it's not content like yeah. something you pour into a jar, right? It's reality and truth, <laughs> right? And and some processes are important because some processes are better at leading us to the truth, yeah. right? Um, but the process is the means, the truth is the end. Um, and it's not merely sort of observable outcomes. So where there's a huge emphasis on the process because of the emphasis on experience, not truth. And then measurable outcomes like you know you're a good citizen or blah blah, blah whatever it may be right yeah, you know? yeah, yeah. Uh, but the uh but i think in the re religious field in the church right it's uh it's deadly because it, it turns it into something that is not nope, my language here only about your subjective experience yeah. your subjective experience is important but if you make it only or equally about your subjective experience then you're missing it right you know our position in catechesis right needs to be us learning the truth that God reveals about himself, mm -hmm. right? That's the root of Catholic doctrine, right? So when you're thinking about Catholic doctrine, right, you you're, you need to be thinking about the reality that is God, right? right? That's God telling us about himself. And that's what we're trying to communicate uh, in catechesis, uh, not your subjective experience. Right. It's, and, not, and... it's, not, it's not a self-development exercise yeah and and this sadly you know for for a while in the, in the 1930s through the the uh, 1950s there was a, a very much a charismatic movement in catechesis that was focused on christ it was christocentric uh uh and it actually came out of some jesuits um uh but and i mean that you know in a very respectful way but it, it uh uh, uh, it was it was old on Jesuit. it was on a <laughs> old Jesuit. Yeah. It was on a very yeah. good path. It was on a very good path. Um, but in the the early 1960s, and I will even say before Vatican II, there 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 took this anthropocentric turn. You had uh, just all kinds of things coming in that we've talked about. But but I think at the at at, at the root of a lot of it uh, was the the influence of modernism uh, uh, on. And the bad philosophies of modernism on right, theology right. and then theology 
on um, uh, catechesis, uh, which, which sure. again, when yeah. when you're that far removed, I think from like the the root of it being bad philosophies, by the time you get to catechesis, it's very difficult for the catechist or the person being catechized to recognize kind of these these flawed uh, systems that undermine what it's saying it's trying to do. Uh, yeah. it, it's very, it, it's, and, and so I'm not, I'm not, you know, while I, while, you know, I do talk critically about these things, I, I will be slow to, to place blame on some of them, except for Grimm, you know, <laughs> I'm okay with doing that because, because wow, he, the theologians, theologians have a responsibility. Yeah. 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 Uh, and, and, uh, people who have graduate degrees in the, these fields have a responsibility, right. To, to know better, right? And to be careful. Yeah. Um, and to be wise and, and, uh, in their, uh, their, what they teach. And the thing is, is during this time, so Groom's book, his methodology really came out in 1980. 1983, mm -hmm. Cardinal Ratzinger is giving an address and he literally, this is, I'm going to quote him because it's not like these things were hidden. Cardinal Ratzinger said this in 1983. So at this point, he's the, the, the prefect for the Congregation of the Doctrine of the Faith. Uh, he says, uh, the new tendency is to rank praxis over truth, which is within the context of neo-Marxist and positivistic philosophies. Now, they now made its way into theology as well. The priority of method over content means the priority of anthropology to theology. Yeah, Boom. Yeah. I mean, yeah. some summed up nicely, uh, you know, it's, yeah. it's. And he says, you know, it was ultimately due to the fact that they no longer had confidence in the whole. It was due to a crisis of faith, or more precisely, to a crisis of faith shared with the church of all ages. Right. Referring, referring to, you know, it was, they, they lost confidence in, uh, uh, in what God had revealed. Right. Uh, and they mm -hmm. put their confidence in themselves, in modern sociology, modern psychology, modern whatever, mm -hmm. modern philosophies. And so it had a, a great effect on uh, catechesis. Um, and so, I, I, you know, I, I hope our listeners have found this uh, to be helpful. Uh, it's, a, it's a very interesting history, and I think it's one that, that needs to be brought out uh, more, um, both from the philosophical perspective, the theological perspective, but also mm. the catechetical perspective, because many of these right. things are still alive today. And we need yeah. to be able to, to root them out and to, and to uh, correct them. Um, yeah, We're, yeah. But before we just end here, and I know we need to wrap up, but just Jason, could you say something about where you see this? I guess the trajectory of this today, or where you see the kind of the the practical, you know, sort of expression. And like, how, how is this working out now? I mean, you you've taken the story up through the '80s and '90s, um, which you know, I mean, to me, the '90s are not that long ago, but you know, <laughs> I, still I know like actually five years are. ago. Right. <laughs> uh well, like where is the conversation where is the 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 sort of center of practice how how that developed uh yeah so it took it took a sharp turn with the advent of the the catechism of the catholic church um and there was a whole movement in the united states to subvert that be, from being okay. published uh right. and we can do a whole nother podcast on that sure. um but but even after even after the catechism was released, there were there were many um, uh, ways that, that to which uh, uh, professional religious educators, which was a new phenomenon as well, um, they tried to subvert a lot of this and keep keep it all about process, keep it all about process and not uh, content. Um, however, it, it there there was uh, there was really faithful people out there that. Um, that said no, that rejected this mm -hmm. idea. Uh, many times they got shoved into, uh, uh, into the sidelines. Uh, one of them I'll mention, um, because, um, it's highly influential was, uh, a guy, a priest named Monsignor Eugene Cavan. He was okay. the only Dean at Catholic U that didn't sign the father Koran statement of oh, protest. Okay. He was the mm -hmm. only Dean at the entire college not to sign that. He, he, uh, mm -hmm. effectively got booted out of Catholic U and mm -hmm. he went on to teach, um, uh, uh, some good Dominican sisters, um, but also, uh, help, uh, teach some influential people. One of them being, 
um, the 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 lady who she actually just passed away last week. Her name was Barbara Morgan, and she's the one that founded the uh, catechetical department at Franciscan University of Steubenville, which I know has gone through some troubles. But I will say, what they teach in in catechetics is formation in the documents and a faithful how to hand on the Catholic faith faithfully. Uh, and fidelity mm. to, the, to the church because it's not about you. It's not about your feelings. It's about handing on what was what has been given to you. Um, right. So, so I mean, there there it's was this, uh, um, you know, and you had these other reactions. Thomas Groom is very also very influential in England, and uh, there was a there was there's there's a book out there called A Generation Betrayed by Eamon Keane, who who talks about uh, um, uh, the 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 havoc that it wreaked. And, and England and, and kind of the uh, movement to come back, uh, uh, come back to a faithful catechesis. So there are a lot of things out there uh, that are there. I, I, I think the trajectory is, is bright as these people pass away. Um, and I, <laughs> I don't mean that, you know, I don't mean that in like there's hope and death, folks. But like, uh, uh, but, but there's for, for a lot of these people, um, there's not a generation that's going to pick up their torch and carry it on. Okay. Um, like most heresies, um, uh, yeah. you know, they're, they're, they eventually they, they, and they, they, they run out of torch carriers. Um, yeah. So, you know, so I am, I am hopeful in that. Um, but that doesn't mean that something else isn't popping up or won't pop up, you know? Right, 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 right. Um so, so there, there are pockets out there, but I think, you know, again, the, the, the biggest thing that we can do or, you know, in that catechist can do is to, to understand the history, but also, you know, take a little philosophy, understand some of the, the, the philosophical problems that underline modernism and uh, many of these other uh, wrong uh, positions in theology that are just, uh, they're not even half, have truths. I mean, they're just mm. completely erroneous. Uh, um, but they have, but they have real effect, uh, particularly in the, uh, application in catechesis. Um, and, and yeah, so yeah, there's great. a, there's that's a great. whole lot there. Yeah, that's, uh, that's good. Thanks for bringing it up to, up to date. Uh, I would just uh, throw it here at the end, uh, um, that, uh, I, I think a document that's really helpful and I'm using a lot in my own, uh, work presently, uh, as catechesi tridendi, mm -hmm. uh, by John Paul II, um, you know, it's it's so helpful because it says two things. One is the goal of catechesis is um, uh, intimate union or intimate communion with Christ, but it doesn't leave it there. Yeah, right? yeah, yeah. Uh, it says that's the goal, but then it says that that's the goal, right? But what is catechesis? And he, and it states very succinctly and clearly, it's organic and systematic instruction in Christian doctrine. Yeah. Um, and that's just that that you got to just hold people to that and say, look, that's what it is. Right. And we can talk about lots of other things, but if you're not doing that, if that isn't your primary emphasis, then you are not doing catechesis. Yeah. And, and I would add, I would add to that, that if you are doing that, you don't have the right to do that. Um, you know, sure. Canon law even states that, you know, a baptized person has the right to a faithful uh, catechesis. Mm -hmm. And John Paul would add, with in all of its rigor and vigor, uh, <laughs> a good, good a good, good quote there from Catechesi Tridende that it's not it's not something that we can piecemeal, but it's something that we have to give whole and entire uh, uh, right. to the person. So with that, I want to thank our listeners uh, for joining us today. I hope you found our, our thoughts and comments uh, helpful uh, in understanding uh, some of these issues. Uh, in the meantime, check us out at catholicstudiesacademy.com. Until next time, God bless. <laughs>